Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update. Join the only official Telegram channel of Rao's Eye Study Circle to get relevant material and important updates. Hello everyone and welcome to Daily News Simplified, your one-stop solution to detailed analysis of current affairs which are published in the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper and are equally relevant for your UPSC preparation. Articles dated 29th of October 2022 are listed on your screen and the timestamping along with the notes in PDF and Word format are given in the description box. So let us begin with the first article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 2nd and talks about the important issue of urban waste management in the city of Delhi. Now recently there was a news article with respect to certain political leaders who have commented that Delhi is going to be a mound of garbage as MCD is planning to implement more number of new landfills across the city and it is going to be 16 in numbers. However, in the reality, it has not been there. MCD or the Municipal Corporation of Delhi has clearly stated that there are no such plans to implement or to bring new landfills across the city. Now, when it comes to the concept of landfills, cities like Delhi and Mumbai are one of the most important and the largest victims of these mounds of garbage these mounds of garbage on the landfills are now even replacing and looking similar to the hilly areas across these cities. Not only that, these landfills are now becoming a matter of concern with respect to the urban garbage management and the environmental pollution. The context says that the MCD has recently stated that they are now processing one-fourth of the legacy waste. Now, legacy waste is something which has been accumulating over the years over a particular place. Landfills are those areas where there is a dumping ground for the waste in the urban cities. And one after the other, there is an the addition of layers of waste material over one another. And this has led to the accumulation of the urban waste material over the past few decades, calling it to be the legacy waste. MCD has claimed that they are now processing one-fourth of the legacy waste which is far more than what they were doing a decade ago. And this has been accomplished at three landfills situated at Okla, Bhaswa and Ghazipur of the city. Now when it comes to the urban waste management, it is a very important topic from the perspective of UPSC's examination not only in the prelims but in the mains as well. In the mains examination, a student can expect a question from GS Paper 1 on issues of urbanization, GS Paper 2 on urban governance, as well as GS Paper 3 on environmental issues from this solid waste management in the urban cities. In this discussion, we are going to have a detailed analysis of urban waste management. We'll go through the details of the article. Then we will move towards that why there is a certain rise in the urban waste across Indian cities. We will also look into the issues faced in the urban waste management across India. What are the issues which are associated with the landfills in the urban centers? There's various studies that have been conducted, various policies and steps taken in this direction and what should be the ideal way forward in this regard. So when we talk about the article, MCD has already stated that they are processing one-fourth of the urban solid waste that they receive. Now, the point is how they are able to do these things. First is that they are utilizing the waste to energy plant. Now in waste to energy plant, what we do is that we collect the biodegradable waste and try to capture the energy resources such as methane from this waste to produce energy. Beyond this, the MCD is also utilizing the segregation process on right time at right place. Now, right time and right place means that the segregation of the waste is at the right time. That is, the moment a waste is generated at the household level or at the industrial level, at the right time it is segregated. 
The waste is not collected in the haphazard manner or in a composite manner. It is distributed on the right time. Right place means that the waste is segregated on the right place. It is not that the waste will be segregated at a public place. It is segregated over a particularly isolated place so that if there is any hazard associated with the segregation process, it should not impact the human life. The third thing that MCD is doing is recycling of waste. So when we talk about the construction materials, so we have construction debris. So why not utilize these construction debris for the further utilization in the construction material? For example, you must have seen that there is a requirement of large quantity of earth or the soil in order to construct a flyover. So flyover construction requires the filling up of soil or the earth material in order to have a flyover during the rising and the falling phase of the flyover. Now, why can't we utilize the construction material for the same? And MCD is utilizing this construction material instead of dumping it in the landfill for the construction purposes, especially for the filling objective in the building construction. The fourth and the last process which MCD has adopted is that they are not planning to set up new landfills because the moment they start bringing new landfill areas, it is going to create more problems for the accumulation of the legacy waste instead of resolving the previous one. So there are no such plans as has been clearly stated by the MCD in the news article. And along with this, whatever waste material that is already lying in the three important landfill areas of the MCD, the government is trying to reduce down that through the augmentation of the waste processing to over 3,400 tons by the year 2025. Now, augmentation will simply means that first, there will be the reduction in the existing landfill and second, no requirement for the new one. However, still we see that the issue of urban waste management persists in India. Now, why do we have the persistence of urban waste issue? The reason being that there is the addition of waste more than what it is actually removed. So the removal of the waste material is almost one fourth. However, the addition is far more than its removal. So every time we see that there is net addition of new waste material over these landfill areas. The second issue is that there is lack of 100% collection that is door to door collection and segregation of the waste material. It is highly seen in the case of slum areas where the door to door collection is quite cumbersome. Then comes a limited number of sites. So there are at least three sites which are as of now functioning in Delhi at a larger scale. So we don't have the number of sites. Hence, the addition is going to there for a long period of time. Then comes that there is no scope for the expansion of the existing st structure because the existing landfill structures are suffering from numerous hurdles, including the leaching of toxic material as well as the frequent fires. And the last one is that there is a lack of infrastructure in these important landfill areas. For example, when we talk about waste to energy plant, so how many of these sites have large scale waste to energy plant? The answer would be very less. And even if they have waste to energy plant, they are very small in their scale. Hence, the infrastructure lacuna will always be there in these cases. Now, the point is why there is rising of urban waste in India. Now, India is a developing country which has ever rising consumer demand as the number of people are rising. The population explosion is there. So is the rising income of the people who are now consuming more, especially with the changing of the lifestyle. So the first is that we are going through the plastic age and this has led to the plastic pollution, which is now beyond controlling limit. Beyond this, we are also going through the rise of consumerism. So everyone who has a good standard of living and a good income earning methods is going to have more consumer related demand for their livelihood. So we have plastic materials, we have packaged materials, we have packaged foods, we have more electronic items, we have more plastic items. And last but not the least, we have more vehicular products.
so every time we try to add one new product into our lifestyle there is a ca cause behind the consumerism and every product that comes after the manufacturing in the hand of the consumer will go through the entire cycle of depreciation finally ending in the landfill area then comes the urban population explosion India is already going through the 32% of the total population to be the urban and in the next census it is going to be much higher which clearly proves that India's population explosion is going to raise the further urban waste material in the future. Beyond this, we also have the issue of the urban sprawl. So there are small cities, small urban areas which are growing across this larger towns and in the lack of basic infrastructure facilities including the urban waste management these cities are more becoming like a burden to the existing urban areas if we go through the basic status of the waste material we'll find that according to the niti Aayog report 0.15 to 0.16 million tons of urban waste material is generated in india and along with that this material, according to the Niti Aayog report, is going to triple by the year 2030, that is just in next 8 years. Now we come to the issues with the urban waste management in India. So why we are not able to manage the entire urban waste generated in our cities? Why it is the problem that we have to fill this material in the landfill areas that further increases the issues with respect to the environment? The first point is that we have a limited formal waste management structure. So most of the time we'll find that the waste management in the country is undertaken through the unorganized and informal mediators or the intermediaries who have hired the people from the slum areas. They are the rag pickers who are not associated with any social security and they are working there just to have the basic needs being met. So this lack of formalization has led to the poor management of the urban waste. Beyond this, we have a high dependence on the informal sector for door-to-door -door collection. So there is a lack of vehicles, there is a lack of trucks, there is a lack of transport vehicles even at the peripheral areas of the cities where the roads are wider to carry out the transportation. Then comes the issue of limited resources such as machines, manpower, storage places of the urban waste management in the cities. Followed by the recycling through the waste to energy plants are still at the primary stage of adoption. As we have discussed, there are very limited number of waste to energy plants with respect to what should be there in the place to manage these waste material. And lastly, there is a lack of financial resources available to the municipal corporation and the urban local bodies. Most of the time, these bodies do not have money even to pay the salaries of the people who are collecting the waste material from door to door. Now, the point is, what are the issues of landfills? Now, from urban waste management, we are shifting towards the issue of landfills because the article was actually focusing upon the landfill area. The first issue is that the leaches that are generated in the landfill areas find their way to the creeks or the sea areas as we have seen in the case of Mumbai or through the Nalas in the case of Delhi and leading to the fresh water sources ultimately polluting the water resources. Now in order to understand how this leaching process function let us go through this diagram. As you can see that this is a landfill area where we have the entire garbage being piled up. Now when this garbage is pi being piled up it has certain toxic materials also. There is a methane gas generation and when there is a rainfall falling on this open area that water of the rainfall leaches towards the nearby area and it creates a leached pound. This pound is having the toxic water and this toxic water further percolates down the soil and ultimately going into the surface water which is being utilized for drinking purposes. This drinking purposes further leads towards the waterborne diseases. The next issue is that there is an ignition of fires in the dump yard due to the presence of methane gas. Now, as we know that there are organic material in the 
landfill areas including the food material and the food waste material that ultimately leads to the generation of methane gas finding the way for the fires in the dry regions. As you can see this is a screenshot taken from the Deona dumping ground in Mumbai. This Deona dumping ground is known for the frequent fires as you can see there is a smoke because of the burning of methane gas and this area is also known for the leaching of toxic material into the creek in the Arabian Sea. The next issue associated with the landfill area is that they are mostly located towards or near the dense population site, ultimately leading towards the pollution, air pollution, water pollution and the generation of diseases to large number of people. The next issue associated is that they are known to deface the urban landscape. So once we find that these are not the hilly areas but the dumping ground, they actually deface the nicely crafted urban landscape of Indian cities. And lastly, they are actually leading towards the development of slum areas because the land area which is available across the landfills are at the cheapest prices available which actually invites the people from the smaller areas smaller towns who are very poor in their background to live in these areas in the clumsy cities and in the shaggy streets causing towards the rise of slum areas so what is the solution and the way forward first solution is that we have to move from the least favorite option to the most favorite option now what we are doing right now we are disposing the waste material we are collecting the waste material and we are disposing it on the landfills. But we should move to the steps backward, ultimately leading towards the prevention of such material. Now, if we talk about, let's say, the food waste material, what should we do with that? So if we have peels of, let's say, vegetables and fruits, that peeled material can be used to produce compost for the house gardening. Then we can also look towards the minimization of the waste material using and recycling and ultimately denying the disposal. And whatever disposal we are having, that should be utilized for waste to energy plants. The next solution is that we should promote the organic farming that will ultimately increase the demand of the processed solid waste material, including the waste material from the fruits and the vegetables. Next comes the Swachh Bharat mission that government has already taken an initiative in which they have called for garbage free cities and allocated thousands of crore rupees for the same. Government is also look, there should be a fuller utilization of solid waste management rule 2016 and the plastic waste management rules 2016 for bringing the polluter pay principle into the objective. The next is that we should look towards phasing out of the plastic in the gradual manner, especially the single use plastic. Still, there are hundreds and thousands of people who have not adopted the phasing out of the single use plastic because of the poor behavioral change. Next comes and this can be utilized through the provide and this can be utilized through providing the subsidies to the recycling plant. More re recycling plants means that they will recycle the existing plastic material being used in the country. Then comes the gasification plants for the utilization of methane and the promotion to the circular economy for that matter. The next one would be the formalization of the rack pickers, providing them the job security, social security, so that they can work in the letter and spirit. Then comes the more taxation on the municipal waste. This will help in generation of the financial resources for the municipal corporation for the further expansion of the infrastructure. It is followed by the penalties for those people who are not segregating the waste material, especially the industrial areas or the large housing societies. It is followed by the decentralized composting. So people should be promoted for their composting activities Government can provide the small compost boxes to the household so that they can utilize the same for improving the manures and the generation of manures. Government can also promote the home gardening and the utilization of the composting by the people at their household level. There should be a 100% recycling of the e-waste material generated in the urban cities. And the last one is that there should be limited release of construction debris in the open environment. This will not only remove the problem 
of the disposal of the waste material but it will also reduce down the air pollution now how can we do that we can go for the open auction for the waste material of the construction sector for the people who are involved in the construction activities now going beyond this solution let us look into the best practices that is being followed in india as well as at the international level so one of the best material was highlighted in a report published by niti ayog and the center for science and environment which says that the chatisgarh's ambikapur maharashtra's chandrapur and kerala's taliparamba have adopted the zero landfill model for the development of these cities and these and this zero landfill model by these three cities is based on the resource recovery and the circular economy now when we talk about the circular economy as you can see on the screen this is the circular economy every product that comes to the market is designed produced distributed and consumed now after the consumption what we are doing is we are throwing it in the landfills and the government is adopting the same and now instead of throwing it in the landfill the consumption of the product and after its depreciation should be sent for the repair or the reuse if it cannot be repaired or the reuse it should be taken as a residual waste further leading to the recycling recovering of the material take the example of a water bottle now if you are consuming a water bottle and instead of throwing it because ultimately it is going to fall in the landfill area now instead of throwing it after the consumption why not reuse the water bottle for the same if you cannot reuse a water bottle at least store it and send it for the recycling purpose this recycled material will be used for the raw material of the further designing and the manufacturing of the product the same plastic bottles can be used to create merchandise such as jeans material now as we were talking about the best practices the second best practice could be learned from the london in london there is a scheme known as food safe scheme in which the composting bins are distributed among the people especially working in the restaurants for the utilization of the food waste material in a city of milan there is a integrated waste collection system in which there is a creation of residential food waste collection programs and the transparent bag program for the recycle material so people are in collecting the recycle material even at their household level the last one is the barter market for recycled products so there is a barter market so if i have something which is waste to me but can be utilized for the other purpose that person will exchange something which is utilized by me in a barter market of recycle it is practiced in the mexico city in mexico with this discussion in place now i am going to leave you with a question to practice This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 12 and talks about the recent initiative of the union government to provide a platform to the social media users to lodge a complaint and to appeal against the methods activities actions taken by the various social media platforms like Facebook Twitter or WhatsApp The context says that the social media users will now have an option to appeal against the grievance redressal process of a particular platform let's say twitter before an appellate panel to be formed by the government and all these will be notified by the center through the amendment that they have done in the it intermediary rules so what we are going to do we are going to read about the grievance appellate committee and the provisions of the it intermediary rules and now it has often been seen in the news articles that government find it difficult to trace the culprit of the social media outrage let's say there is a fake news which is going viral across the nation now who has actually generated the fake news at a first instance it is really very hard for the government to find out that the moment government try to control such fake news spread and try to identify the originator of that fake news they face the hurdle from the social media platforms on the pretext of controlling the privacy now it has been observed that when government try to identify such people and would like to take action against them 
the social media platform take the utilization of the fundamental rights of right to privacy and try to hide the sensitive information from the government. Now, this is just the one side. The other side says that when people who are on the social media are being harassed by these platforms themselves, they have nowhere to go to lodge their complaints. Let's say there's a person A who has been harassed on WhatsApp or who has been dubbed or who has been cheated in the financial terms on a particular social media. Now, when that person try to file a complaint, they don't have any authority to approach. Now, government through the IT intermediary rules have tried to identify such people. And under these rules, government has made it mandatory for these platforms, including Facebook, WhatsApp and Twitter to have a grievance redressal mechanism where the people who have been harassed or the people who are victim to the social media crimes can lodge a complaint. But now comes the real point. What if the grievance redressal mechanism of these platform do not function properly? Or what if they actually go biased in favor of the platforms or the companies themselves? Then where will the victim go in order to get the justice? Now, for that matter, government has created the grievance appellate committee in which a person who is not satisfied with the process of the grievance redressal on a particular platform will now approach this grievance appellate committee to lodge a complaint. This committee will have power to overturn the content moderation decision made by the social media platform. For example, Twitter has posted a particular text on the social media and that particular text or particular message has created a communal tension in the country. And now when government try to go to lodge a complaint on that particular post, Twitter just alter or moderate that comment without removing it from the public platform. Now in this case, the grievance appellate committee or GAC will have power to remove that content and function in favor of the victim. This committee will have a chairman, two full-time members, one ex-official member and two independent members who will be appointed by the center. This committee will be functioning under the 30-day appeal period. So if a person who is not satisfied with the decision of a grievance redressal mechanism of a particular platform or a company will have 30 days to approach the grievance appellate committee. Now, from where this committee come into existence? The origin of this committee is traced from the IT intermediary rules, which are as follows. Now, IT or information technology intermediary guidelines and digital media ethics code were released in 2021 by the Ministry of Electronic and Information Technology. There are the four important pointers that should be known to the students. The first one is that it provides social media intermediaries with the registered users in India above a particular threshold, let's say a million, should be classified as a SSMI or significant social media intermediaries. This includes Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter and many other. These SSMIs as per the rules are required to appoint certain person for the compliance of the rules, identification of the first originator of a particular instance or information, let's say fake news, deploy their technology to the best of their efforts to identify certain types of content that whether this content is communal, whether this content is not communal, can this content be lethal to the security and the peace of the society or not? So there should be a particularly technology or maybe let's say artificial intelligence to identify such social media post. Along with this, there will be the regulation of the content by the online publication for news and the current affairs, including the audio visual content so that even the online platforms publishing the current affairs or the news articles may not dilute the social fabric of India. And the last one, all such intermediaries or the companies are required to provide the grievance redressal mechanism for resolving the complaints by various victims. Now, if a person is not satisfied with these grievance redressal mechanism, they have a chance to approach the GAC. 
Now, what are the key issues with this? The first one is these rules are good in sense, but they go beyond the powers delegated under the Information Technology Act. Secondly, they restrict the online content and hinders the freedom of speech. There is no safeguard provided to the person who has been accused, let's say the person or an authority in a particular social media platform. And lastly, they go against the privacy of the individual because they enable the identification of the first originator. What if the first originator had the bona fide objective and not the malafide intention to hurt the sentiments of a particular group? All these key issues need to be rectified before bringing these rules into the complete practice. With this discussion place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 8th and talks about an important scheduled tribe in the state of Himachal Pradesh against which there has been the protest regarding the notification published by the union government. Now, in the month of September, the Union Cabinet has approved a Constitution Amendment Bill that seeks to grant the tribal status among many communities, which includes the Hatti community living in the Trans-Giri region of Himachal Pradesh. Now, after the notification, there has been some protest by the other scheduled tribe community of the state, including the Gujar community. Now, why there was a protest? First of all, Gujars who are the only scheduled tribe community in the Sirma district are saying that they will be left marginalized because Hathis are almost 10 times the population of Gujars in that particular district. So the jobs which were available to the Gujar tribe in that particular district of Sirmaur will now be snatched away by the Hathis as per the Gujar expert. As per the locals, most of the Hathi groups are actually the birds Kash and Kanites, which are considered to be upper caste in the state. And based on this particular distribution, the population of scheduled tribe in the state is only 5.71%, which is below the national average. Now, based on this, the Gujars and the other tribal communities have been protesting that providing the scheduled tribe status to the Hathis will go against the benefits which are enjoyed by the marginalized sections of the scheduled tribes in the state of Himachal Pradesh. Now, from this perspective, let us understand that how tribal communities are being designated. As per the Article 342 of the Indian Constitution, the specification of certain tribes as well as the tribal groups and the recognition for the reservation is part of the constitutional proceedings. All these tribal groups, as per the constitution, will only enjoy the benefits available to the scheduled tribes only to a particular state and the union territories and not outside that. Now, this is a positive as well as a negative initiative. The positive side being that it protects the competition among the different tribal groups between the states. So let's say there's a tribal group which is living in the Chhattisgarh and there's a tribal group living in the state of Madhya Pradesh. Now both are actually divided through the administrative borders. Hence, they can enjoy the benefits in their particular area. However, the negative repercussion of this decision is that there might be the case where a particular community is distributed among two states. Now the same community can be provided reservation in the one in a particular community, in a particular category, let's say scheduled tribe or scheduled caste, while the other will be denied the same in the other state. The parliament by law may include or exclude from the list of the scheduled tribe, that is the existing list, a particular community through a notification. And this is the notification which was actually forwarded by the union cabinet minister. Now, as per the convention, that is the popular practice in India. These are the important five criteria used to identify a particular community to be a scheduled tribe or not. And these five criteria were utilized to identify Hathis to be the tribal community to be scheduled under the scheduled tribe of India. The first one is the indication of the primitive trait that is the community should have the primitive trait that is their food habit, customs, tradition should be primitive in nature. The second is that they should have a distinctive culture which should not be followed by the other community in the nearby area. They should be geographically isolated. So as you will find that most of the tribes belonging to India are either living in the dense forest areas or they are living in the hilly areas of Himalayas or the Deccan. 
Hence, they are geographically isolated. They should have a shyness of contact with the community at large. The best example here could be the Sentinels of the Andaman Nicobar who are absolutely shy to go and contact with the other communities. And the last one is their backwardness in terms of the customs and the social practices. Now, the point is that it is not mentioned in the constitution or any other law. It is a conventional practice, hence followed because of the larger acceptance. There are hundreds of issues which are associated with this criteria. For example, what is the distinctive culture? How can we say that the tribal culture of a particular community is different from that of the others? This differentiation is very hard to identify. Sometimes the tribal communities are not geographically isolated. They actually reside with the other communities including the community from the majority group. They sometimes are not shy in nature and most of them as of now after the independence many tribal groups are there which have a very high literacy and education rate and many of them are actually also going towards the high standard of living. The percentage remains the low, however, it is changing. So identifying the, a particular community to be backward in these criteria is a very, very tough job. So the point is that do we need to change the existing criteria? The answer would be yes. Why? The first is that there is a change which is going on among the communities. There's a modernization, the impact of globalization can be seen. We have the cases of Sanskritization of different communities where the backward communities are adopting the practices of the forward communities. The spread of education, the good health, the higher standard of living, increasing per capita income has led to the modernization of certain communities that has ultimately led to the expansion of the human development indices among these groups. So identifying them to be backward remains the matter of concern. The second is that there is a lot of migration which is going on within India because of the political, economic and ecological reasons. So there are people who are residing, who were born in a particular state, in a particular community, may because of a job prospectus, may shift to the other state or other city. Now they are actually denied of a particular community status and the reservation provisions. Hence, the clause of isolation remains to be subjective. And the last one is that the concept of primitive itself is a subjective issue. What is primitive? Is residing in the forest means primitive? In that case, the communities who are living in the urban area should be denied reservation. So this primitivity remains a matter of concern in the criteria itself. So what should be the ideal way forward? There was a proposal which was made by National Commission for Scheduled Tribe to increase the criteria concept to identify certain communities under the scheduled list. The first one is that they should have certain community name. They should not be nameless community. They should have a distinct language and the dialect. They should have a presence of core culture that is life cycle, song, dances, folklore, paintings, festivals and others. There should be endogamy. They should not promote the exogamy that is marital relationship primarily within their own community. They should follow the autonomous religious beliefs and the practices. There should be a traditional institutions of social control which is limited to their own people. That is, they might have certain provisions with respect to the women, married women or the unmarried girls. They should have a particular customs with respect to the men in the society, the teenagers and so and so forth. They should have a low level of techno-led economy. It should not be that a particular community, even if they are having a large section of population to be the IT professional, they should be provided a reservation just because they belong to a particular community. And lastly, they should have a relative backwardness in terms of socio, economic and education. Now, previously, social and educational remains to be the prime criteria. The NCST says that economic criteria should also be the part based on the recent studies. So based on this, the criteria of identification should be enlarged. The moment it is enlarged, there will be less conflict between the communities as we have seen in the case of Himachal Pradesh. So this is what government can choose in the near future with respect to the identification of communities under ST list. Now before concluding the discussion, we should also look into the prelims related facts. The first one is that the highest share of absolute Tribal population resides in the state of Madhya Pradesh at 14.7%. This is, I repeat, the absolute format. The second is Maharashtra followed by Odisha, Rajasthan and Gujarat. As you can observe that most of these states are in the central part of India where there is a good 
quantum of forest then comes the relative advantage in terms of relative quantity lakshadweep follows the largest share lakshadweep holds the largest share of tribal community in a particular area in terms of percentage this is followed by mizoram nagaland all three of them are in the northeastern part of india having dense forest and age old tribal communities and the fifth position is held by ladakh at around 79.5% with the discussion place let us now move to the last article for the day this article of the hindu newspaper appeared on page 12 and talks about the proposal given by the prime minister of india mr narendra modi about the one nation one police uniform now from the perspective of the upsc examination this concept is not that much important because it is not a scheme it is not something which is very controversial to the pretext of india's governance and polity however we are going to look into the pros and cons of such a proposal given by the prime minister so as far as pros are concerned so definitely such kind of uniformity will give a common identity to the law enforcement and citizen will recognize police personnel anywhere in the country it will ensure similar quality of products being provided including the quality of clothing for example in maharashtra police personnel brought a khaki clothes on their own having different shades and qualities so uniformity will reduce that kind of dissimilarities even though law and order is under the state list of the seventh schedule of the constitution however such kind of uniformity and unity is important for the country as a whole it will help india to move one step closer to the concept of one nation one police and will remove down the ambiguities and the differentiation among the different states because it has been seen that there is lack of cooperation between the different state police agencies across the nation especially with respect to the interstate crimes now coming to the cons critics believe that such kind of uniformity goes against the plurality and the federal nature of the constitution now indian constitution is a quasi federal where there is a right balance between the powers of the central and the powers of the state now if center try to move into the powers of the state through the bringing of the uniformity there will be the interference or the unwanted interference into the governance system of the state police this goes as an attack on the constitution and the basic framework of federalism it actually lays down the red carpet for the over centralization and the imposition of the central policy on the state police some of the distinctions are natural for example in west bengal white color uniform is used in order to adjust to the hot and the humid climate bringing a uniformity will not be sufficient enough to meet such kind of environmental and geological demands for example the traffic police wears the white and the blue color uniform and it is for the differentiation and for the safety so overall what do we think the concept of one nation one police uniform seems to be very ideal however already there is a federal related issues that need to be answered that need to be resolved before getting into the absolute nature of police governance which is already under the hands of the state government with this discussion please now we come to the end of today's daily news simplified thank you